Good evening. My name is Ted Steinbach. I am a board member of the Filson Historical Society, and I want to thank you for joining us this evening for the Gertrude Polk Brown Lecture Series featuring Karen Tumulty, author of The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. Now I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Karen Tumulty. She holds a Bachelor of Jur Journalism from the University of Texas at Austin and an MBA from Harvard Business School. She is an opinion editor and columnist for the Washington Post and has received the Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. She joined the Post in 2010 after 15 years at Time Magazine and her career resulted in more than three dozen cover stories, including positions as congressional correspondents and White House correspondent. Prior to that, Tumulty also had a distinguished career at the Los Angeles Times covering Congress, business, energy, and economics. Tonight's presentation will be moderated by Richard Clay, the president and CEO of the Filson Historical Society. At the conclusion of the presentation, Mr. Clay will moderate questions as time permits. There are two microphones on the landing for our in-person attendees. If you are joining us virtually, please submit your questions in the chat box. The author will be signing and selling her book immediately following the lecture in the main lobby. Thank you again for joining us tonight, and please welcome Karen Tumulty. Welcome and good evening. Let's start with who this book might really be about. Is it about Ronald Reagan as much, Karen, as it is about Nancy? Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming out tonight and thank you to the Filson for hosting me. Um, you know, when I started this book, it's the first book I've ever written, I wasn't really sure where I was going. I was, you know, I knew the stereotypes about Nancy Reagan, who was a very, very complex person. But the more I learned about her, the more I learned about him. And late, late one night when I'm having yet another bout of insomnia, like what have I gotten myself into? I'm deep into a big Lou Cannon biography of Ronald Reagan. And I come across one line that Lou Cannon wrote. It's the first line in my book. It says, Ronald Reagan always knew where he wanted to go, but she had a better sense of what it was going to take to get there. And I, that's the moment I realized that what kind of book I wanted to write. And I also hoped that if I could pull this book off, that people would come away with a much better sense, not only of her, but of him and of really the entire Reagan era. Um, at the beginning of the book, you have an anecdote that the uh, marvelous Secretary of State George Shultz told you about Nancy Reagan. Talk to us about that because I, th I thought it was very insightful um, as to how she operated and the importance that she brought to her side of the equation in that marriage. Uh, so I interviewed George Schultz, I think was, he was 97 years old when I interviewed him. Um, it was probably the third interview I did in what would turn out to be a four and a half year project on this book. But he told me a story that I think really did sort of frame her influence. And that was in February of 1983, Schultz would go on to be one of the longest serving secretaries of state in history, but he's brand new in the job. And the truth is 
he didn't really know the Reagans all that well. Um, Alexander Haig, the first Secretary of State, had been kind of a disaster and was dispatched. And so Schultz is not really sure what the president's agenda is. He's in a he's in an administration full of hardliners who believe that there could never be anything like a working relationship with the Soviet Union. So it's February 1983. He's coming back from a trip to China. Washington gets socked in by a blizzard. And as one of the worst of the century, and as the city is digging out, George Schultz gets a call from Nancy Reagan. And she says, you know, why don't you and your wife come over for dinner? It'll just be the four of us. So the Schultzes show up and it starts out up in the family quarters in the White House as what appears to be just a social evening. But all of a sudden Schultz starts getting pounded by questions from both of the Reagans. Um, what are the Chinese really like? What, do these people have a bottom line? Do they have a sense of humor? Do they? And then they move on to questions about the Soviet Union. And all of a sudden it dawns on Schultz. This guy, for all of his hardline rhetoric over the years, is, has never met a big time communist leader. And he is dying to engage and he is confident of his skills as a negotiator. And then the second thing that dawns on Schultz is that this wasn't a social evening at all, that Nancy Reagan had set up this dinner because she wanted to get Schultz away from the guys at the Pentagon, away from the NSC, so that he could sit down and listen to Reagan himself, who, as much as people at the time thought of him as a hardliner, he was also an idealist, a deeply religious man who believed the biblical prophecies of Armageddon and didn't want the world to end in nuclear war. And Schultz recognized a third thing that night, he told me, and he said, the third thing he figured out was anybody with any brains would make a friend of the first lady. And it really was, Nancy Reagan was not a geopolitical strategist, but she did know that she didn't want her husband to go down in history as some kind of cowboy from the rest, you know, some kind of warmonger. She actually had hoped that at some point he might even win the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, for instance, when Reagan used the phrase evil empire, he writes in his diary, Nancy hated it. And they, they were a real married couple. I mean, they would have these, these big arguments over things like that. And when it finally, Reagan in the first few years of his administration, he has three elderly Soviet leaders die on him. So there's no way of negotiating them. But this new young, charismatic, vigorous figure, Mikhail Gorbachev, suddenly emerges as the new generation of Soviet leader. And it was really Nancy who pushed as hard as anyone in that White House, not only for an early summit, but one that would have a much more expansive agenda than what a lot of the people at the Pentagon and the NSC wanted to see. Talk to us, if you would, about both of their childhoods and family situations and how those experiences for both of them combined to make for a very successful marriage. Well, the, the Reagans were not only a great love story, but they were also a couple, it, it was interesting, they really augmented each other's strengths and compensated for each other's vulnerabilities and weaknesses. And he was, she, well, let me start with her. She grew up uh, in a very precarious situation. Her mother was an actress who 
essentially abandoned her for much of her childhood. It leaves her very wary, very insecure, very anxious for her entire life. You know, she's convinced that no matter how well things are going, that the bottom could drop out at any moment. But she also develops an incredibly keen antenna about people that, among other people, her son Ron, really traced to the anxiety of, of her childhood and the abandonment she had felt. Ronald Reagan grows up the son of an alcoholic father who, for other reasons, that family also was in a very precarious situation. I think they moved five times before Reagan was 10 years old, primarily because his father kept losing jobs. So he grows up with a couple of traits that you often see in children of alcoholics. Um, one is that as, as skilled as he was, as, as talented as he was connecting with the country. I mean, can you imagine any politician today who could win 49 states as he did in 1984? He was in fact a sort of remote figure. He never, he basically let one person in the entire world get close to him and he married her. But he was also very non-confrontational he, he tended to sort of believe the best in the people who were around him. And it really would often fall to Nancy, who had, sometimes she could be pretty clueless about her own image, but about him, she had incredible instincts of who was serving him, who talked a good game, and, and who was a liability. And she would make sure that anybody who, was around who wasn't serving him wasn't around for very long. I mean, she is actually one of the reasons that Ronald Reagan went through seven national security advisors. Um, she very rarely set foot in the West Wing, but if she was unhappy about something, everybody knew it. And if she was unhappy with somebody, they didn't tend to last for very long. What were some of the roles that she played in the White House? Some of the issues that she uh, confronted head on? Um, there are a couple of chapters that I'm very proud of in the book. Um, and one is the degree to which she ran the rescue effort during the Iran-Contra scandal. Now, not everybody remembers the details of this, but basically what had happened was that, that we were basically, Ronald Reagan, who had been a lifeguard in his youth, it was a torment to him that Americans were being held hostage by Hezbollah in the Middle East. And so to get some of them freed, he agreed to trade arms to the Iranians. It was a violation of US policy. He also, what happened during that time was that some of the money from those arms sales illegally uh, was diverted to the anti-communist guerrillas in Nicaragua who were known as the Contras. This was a violation of US law. And it was a very serious scandal and it, it was being done out of a sort of off the shelf covert operation in the National Security Council. Depending on how this went, Ronald Reagan, had he been shown to be complicit, especially in that second part of it, he could have been impeached. And um, again, it was a very serious scandal, but it was really Nancy Reagan who recognizes the danger at a time when everybody else in the White House is sort of trying to cover their own keister. She is convinced that, you know, heads have to roll, starting with the White House Chief of Staff, Don Regan. Um, she, she and Reagan just went at it uh, because he didn't want to fire Regan. He didn't want to do the, the kind of cleaning of the house. And again, I have, in here, a lot of the sort of 
machinations that were going on behind the scenes. But then comes something that is just as hard as the house cleaning, which is getting her husband to admit to the country that he had made a horrific mistake in selling arms to the Iranians. And it is Nancy, when it is finally determined that he is going to give a nationally televised speech, um, who she won't let the West Wing guys write it. At that point, the speech writing shop is, again, everybody is in this self-protective mode. She brings in her choice of speech writer. And then she brings in the, and this was a little irregular, uh, but she brings in John Tower, the former senator from Texas, who was running the investigation that is going to produce a scathing report about her husband. And she brings him up to a private meeting in the White House. She brings him in through a, people don't know about this, but there is a, a tunnel that starts in the Treasury building that you can get into the White House where nobody's going to see you coming in any of the main entrances. And she has John Tower sit there and explain to Reagan how deep the trouble really is for him with the speechwriter, a guy named Landon Parvin, who shared all of his notes from this evening with me. And it really is at that moment that Reagan is finally ready to stand up in front of the country on national television and basically say, in my heart, I find this hard to accept. But as I look at the facts, I know that what I did was wrong. And by giving that speech overnight, the polls showed his approval rating went up by nine percentage points because he was restoring the bond of trust with the country. What about her role in diplomacy uh, with respect to the Soviet Union at the time? Again, she really was, uh, she just kept pushing and pushing and pushing um, for there to be these negotiations, for the agenda to be ambitious. Now, mind you, I'm, she was not pushing Reagan anywhere that he didn't want to go. But the fact is, she understood things about her husband that his closest advisors didn't. And again, part of that was that there was this idealized idealism to Ronald Reagan as well as the you know hardline anti-communist uh, cold warrior that you know the country had probably seen been seeing for decades. So it really was. Number one, she had, a, I think, a much, a, she was much more attuned to what his place in history would be, I think, even more so than he was. But she, she also understood what could really cement that place in history. History has, has looked, I think, kindly at his presidency. I mean, he is regularly ranked in the top 10 or 11 presidents of the United States in the, all the various rankings. What accounts for that in your mind? What are the components of what makes him um, commonly referenced as a near great president? Um, I think for all of these presidents, uh, it's kind of the degree to which they met the moment in which they were living. And Ronald Reagan comes along at a moment where the country really needs a shot of confidence in itself, a shot of optimism. And he is, you know, he is the person who really delivers that. Um, he it um, and again, it's it's remarkable. I mean, his his nineteen eighty um, election was a, a landslide, but by nineteen eighty two, 
the country is in its worst recession since the Great Depression. But by 1984, um, you know, it really does feel sort of like morning in America to most of the country. So he, he manages to win 49 states and comes pretty darn close in Walter Mondale's home state of Minnesota. Now, mind you, though, for all of his popularity, um, you know, it was a, uh, it was a time of some not as bad as what we see today, but you know, the two parties had very, very different um, views of policy and pretty much everything. And um, Reagan himself was so popular that in a lot of ways the, the Democrats, you know, I mean, they called him, you know, the Teflon president because criticism would just slide off of him. And I, as I write in the book, if he was the Teflon president, she was the Velcro first lady. And, um, you know, so a lot of the criticism she got, and again, she brought a lot of it on herself. Uh, Nancy Reagan was a person with her demons, her flaws. The book does not shy away from any of them, but the degree to which she was constantly getting hit with criticism was remarkable and in my view, somewhat sexist. But here are just a few of the nicknames that she was called along the way. The Iron Butterfly, the Belle of Rodeo Drive, Fancy Nancy, the Cutout Doll, the Evita of Bel Air, Mommy Dearest, the Hairdo with Anxiety, and my personal favorite, Attila the Hen. Ah. Well, I guess we ought to, uh, on that note, talk a bit about the White House, China, and astrology as well. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of her worst mistakes were made in the very first year of the presidency. Um, she goes out and again, it's the, it's the worst moment economically for the country since the Great Depression, probably not a great moment to be redecorating the White House and buying China, by the way, not with public money, with donated money, but that cost over $1,000 a place setting. I mean, where Jackie Kennedy had had achieved a claim redecorating the White House, that was not exactly the way it ended up for Nancy Reagan. Um, but she she figures it out, you know. By 1982, 83, she's embarking on her her drug cause. By 1984, she's kind of got her her feet under her. But as I said, during Iran Contra she maneuvers to have the White House Chief of Staff, Don Regan, fired. And he gets revenge near the end of the Reagan presidency when he writes a memoir. And on the very first page of the book, he reveals something that was a deep, deep, dark secret in the Reagan White House, which is that Nancy Reagan was entrusting a lot of the president's schedule to an astrologer. I mean, like they would say he'd be taking, the president would be taking a foreign trip and they would notify the press, okay, be at Andrews at 2 a.m. The flight's got to take off at 2.13 a.m. And, you know, people are going, why are we leaving at two in the morning? And they would tell the reporters, oh, it's jet lag. We're just, that'll be easier on jet lag. Well, what really happened, and you know, it was it was a goofy situation. And by the way, Nancy Reagan had only met the woman who was the astrologer once or twice in person. I mean, can you imagine anything more dangerous than entrusting the schedule of the leader of the free world to, to an astrologer? But it all goes back to the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan three months into his presidency, where he came, and again, it's, I have a chapter, he came, it was harrowing, he came much closer to dying than they told the country at the time. Ronald Reagan, though, was, because he was deeply religious, he had this belief that 
God had spared him for a reason. God had a plan. Nancy Reagan did not have that foundation in faith. Her, her father, who she adored, was actually an atheist. And as I said, she was incredibly anxious. She um, would, uh, she was just convinced that every time her husband left the White House, there was somebody out there waiting to finish off the job that John Hinckley started. She would obsess on things like the fact that presidents who were elected in years that ended in a zero tended to die in office. And so she was just grasping for anything that could give her a sense of control. And back when she and Reagan were coming up in Hollywood, astrology was, I mean, show business is kind of a superstitious profession anyway, but Astrology was kind of a big thing, and you know, people would consult astrologers to decide when to get married, you know, when to sign a contract. So I'm not saying it wasn't goofy; it was goofy, but um, it was something that you know was was sort of part of her, you know, her her background. And so she, what she would do is she would enlist Michael Bieber, her closest ally in the White House to, she'd go to Camp David on the weekends, have her phone conversations with the astrologer. The astrologer would say, oh, this is a good day for this, and this is a bad day for that. And the, the people in the White House couldn't understand why Deaver was just always mucking with the schedule. And this was a White House where everything ran really, you know, like clockwork, except for the scheduling. And Deaver kept it a secret, but he left early in the second term. So what had been a very, very closely guarded secret was known to more people. And Don Regan, as White House Chief of Staff, would actually keep a calendar on his desk with notations in like a stoplight in red, yellow, and green. Like the president can go out this day, he can't otherwise. And so when he was writing his own book, he certainly had the, the ammo that, uh, that he was looking for against the woman who had cost him his job. Reagan's, the end of his presidency and then the denouement of his life. Could you talk to us about that and her role in um, both protecting and uplifting him? So, um, you know, most presidents get to shape their own legacy. They live a long time after they are out of office. Um, and Ronald Reagan, by all outward appearances, was, you know, a healthy, fit 80-year-old when he left the White House. I mean, that looks like a youth movement these days. Um, but, you know, by... And I look in the book at, you know, what the, I'm not convinced by the, the records that are available, by the things that the White House physicians have said, by what people were, I, I do not think there was anything that resembled serious impairment while he was in the White House. Uh, Ronald Reagan was never good with names and details, and he would sometimes, you know, get his facts mixed up, uh, even as a young man. Uh, but he, by 1991, he's starting to show some signs that there's something wrong. And by 1994, he handwrites a letter to the country announcing that he has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And at that point, it really does fall to Nancy Reagan to protect and guard his legacy. She, um, she was very suspicious of people who, you know, as Reagan's stature within the conservative movement grows, she was very suspicious of people who would try to sort of invoke him to further their own agendas. And one thing, for instance, um, early on when the Republicans took over the House in 1994, there was a movement to replace Franklin D. Roosevelt on the dime with, Ron, with a, a profile of Ronald Reagan. 
And Nancy Reagan stands up and says publicly, she says, my husband worshiped FDR. He would hate it if, if somebody did that. Um, she, so she was very protective. It is Nancy Reagan who then oversees the building of the library. And what I think were among her greatest gifts to her husband's legacy were her insistence and her efforts to publish his diaries. Ronald Reagan was one of the few presidents who actually kept a diary in the White House. Um, you might be interested in knowing that as much as we're hearing about the Presidential Records Act these days, those were person, those, the National Archives allowed Ronald Reagan's diaries to be classified as personal. So it was really Nancy Reagan who makes the decision to publish them in part because she wants history to see her husband's unvarnished thoughts. And in the course of writing this book, I spent a lot of time with the diaries and other things that Ronald Reagan had written in his own hand. And you really do see that, you know, the, he was not some actor reading a script. He was not the amiable dunce that Clark Clifford claimed he was. Uh, you can actually see in his, in his speeches that he was giving in the late 70s, speeches that were written in his own hand that also Nancy Reagan got published, that really all the foundational ideas of the Reagan administration were there and that they were his. I mean, she, she wanted history to really know who he was and to be accurate about it. And at a moment when there were just a lot of other people out there sort of trying to uh, claim Reagan's legacy as their own. When you, well, well let me ask you this, what led you to Nancy Reagan in the first place? Oh, so this story is not gonna make you think very highly of me as a political reporter. But um, the, my former editor at Time Magazine was, um, is also the head of nonfiction at Simon & Schuster. And she had had various book ideas for me over the years and none of them ever really struck me. But in 2016, a few months after Nancy Reagan died, it's early fall. And she comes to me and she says, we like a big biography of Nancy Reagan. And being the shrewd political analyst I am, I thought, you know, Hillary Clinton's gonna be such a conventional president, I'm gonna need an outside project. So that's how I ended up uh, right, getting into this book. But the truth is, um, you know, other than I was, I came to Washington as a young reporter in the 80s, but I was mostly covering Congress. So I, all I really knew about her were sort of the cliches. I mean, the, the books that had been written about her were really either hagiography or scandalous, you know, gossipy books. Um, and, you know, it was really in the course of what I thought would be a two year project that turned into a four and a half year project that I began to understand that this was just an incredibly complicated person whose, um, you know, whose had never really been understood. And I think whose influence had never been recognized for what it was. And I was fortunate because, you know, in Reagan world, they're not necessarily going to think they're gonna trust a Washington Post reporter. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people by the second and the third and the fourth time I would come to them, I also got a sense that they too had reached moments in their own lives where they were ready to tell stories that um, hadn't been told before. Um, and some of the finds were remarkable. Uh, her stepbrother, 94 years old, has, has, had never really talked that much to people. And his wife said, he won't talk to you, but I spent hours with him. And he uh, told me things. One thing I realized is no matter how old you get, sibling rivalry never dies. 
he would he told me not once but twice you know if you want this to be a good book you can't just write the nice things um you know it's he's the one who tells me she had a brief early engagement that she broke it off because she discovered her first fiance was gay um and you know people would again she she was incredibly complicated as as you know part of the collateral damage of the great love that the Reagans felt for each other was as her daughter Patty said at her funeral, you know, they were so close, so tightly bonded that everybody else sort of, including their children, floated around on the outside. And as Nancy Reagan herself would write, you know, one of her great heartbreaks was the deep dysfunction in the Reagan family she would write in her own memoir, all I ever really wanted was to be a good wife and a good mother. And I guess I succeeded more at one than the other. And in the dedication of her memoir, she writes to Ronnie who always understood and to my children who I hope will understand someday. Wow. Um, President Reagan had an interesting relationship with Speaker Tip O'Neill. Can you talk to us about that and the model that it set for the country? Well, I think that, you know, Washington itself was such a different place back then. I mean, people did sort of, and it, it wasn't like people weren't, wouldn't have gigantic battles, the two parties, but people could understand that at the end of the day, you respect each other and you assume that your adversaries are coming at this from, you know, a, also a public spirited place. So yes, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, two old Irishmen could sit there at the end of the day and have a drink and actually like each other personally. Uh, Nancy Reagan, was relentless in courting a lot of the sort of Georgetown crowd that would, you know, sort of might otherwise have kind of looked down their noses at her, her husband, this cowboy from the West. She would go out for regular lunches with Catherine Graham, who owned my newspaper, whose family owned my newspaper. Um, she also understood from the very beginning of his political career, people talk about the, the Reagan kitchen cabinet in California. As um, Ron Reagan explained to me, that was all Nancy. It was Ronald Reagan would just as soon be out on his ranch, you know, chopping wood by himself. It was really Nancy who would cultivate those relationships that were uh, crucial to his rise. Let's springboard from this to the role of First Ladies um, in modern times and your observations there. Well, I mean, the, the thing about First Lady is, and this is almost a cliche, you know, it is a role that comes with no job description, no mandate, and each of them, all women, women so far, kind of have to figure it out for themselves. And, um, you know, and it, it, they too, it's, it's the moment in history in which you find yourself. It is your relationship with the person who is president and what he needs. Um, and there's also something else I, thought as I, the more I thought about it and the more I looked at other first ladies. And that is when the word powerful is applied to describe a first lady, it is never meant as a compliment. And I mean, because on the one hand, the country, you know, loves its first ladies. On the other, people have sort of a, a an idea of what the role is to be and what the role shouldn't be. So this is uh, why, you know, after the Iran-Contra scandal, as people in Washington are beginning to understand how 
extraordinarily powerful Nancy Reagan really is in this White House, even the, as you know, people have been dismissing her as, as a fashionista socialite from Beverly Hills, um, all of a sudden it's people like William Sapphire, the New York Times uh, uh, columnist is writing about her as in his words, an incipient Edith Wilson, who was basically running the country when Woodrow Wilson was incapacitated by, by a stroke. Mm. And she did have excellent relationships with some journalists like George Will, uh, who, as I, from the book, uh, they ate lunch a lot together. And he was instrumental in helping her, as I understand it, formulate um, the hagiography after the president died. He, um, one thing, yeah, the two of them would get together and often in George Will's columns, people thought they could hear Nancy Reagan's voice. And this was especially true when he was writing about the Bushes who neither of them liked. Uh, and in fact, the uh, Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush's uh, antagonism toward each other uh, is, is epic throughout the, the time in the White House and beyond. Um, and so, but with, Nancy Reagan and George Will, yeah, they would spend, um, they would hike Civil War battlefields together if, if something bothered her, it tended to bother him too. And again, people got to the point where they, uh, they thought they could sometimes hear Nancy's voice in Will's column. The, the Nancy Reagan, Barbara Bush enmity went back a long way to a previous campaign. Talk to us about that, if you would. This, this is the 1980 Republican primary um, where George H.W. Bush is the last man standing against Ronald Reagan. And um, so he becomes a surprise pick for vice president at the 1980 convention. There was a completely boneheaded idea for a while during that convention that they were going to put Jerry Ford on the ticket as vice president to a man against whom the two of them had run in 1976. So when they finally realized that's really not going to work or sit well, um, George H.W. Bush suddenly finds himself the vice presidential pick. But Nancy never was, I mean, people at the time write about all of them standing on the stage there at the convention and you could just see how unhappy she was to find herself there. But she and Barbara Bush had a, first of all, Barbara Bush could give as well as she could take. And so the two of them were often going after each other privately. And, um, you know, I think, it, there were things too about the Bushes that, you know, they were, the, the Reagans were viewed as sort of the, the new month, the Aravists from California. Barbara Bush could trace her pedigree, you know, practically back to the Mayflower. Um, the Bushes were a very constant, present and close and loving family um, where Nancy Reagan was getting criticized for everything, you know, the press loved Barbara Bush. So it, it all, one place where it all comes to a head is the single most glittering social event of the Reagan White House years is when Prince Charles and Princess Diana come for a state dinner. And they put together the invitation list and for some reason, the Bush's names keep getting crossed off uh, in heavy, heavy black marker. And then the second go round on the invitation list, and once again, the Bush's names are crossed off. So, you know, it was, there, it was just sort of, it got sort of petty between the two of them. Uh, and at one point, uh, Air Force Two is flying up 
to New Hampshire as George H.W. Bush is, is getting ready to mount his own campaign for president. And Barbara Bush comes to the back of the plane, which is where the press sits, and she starts doing imitations of Nancy Reagan that are just vicious, two reporters. And so Lou Cannon of the Washington Post says to her, she says, you know, Mrs. Bush, you know, Mrs. Reagan has spies everywhere. She's going to hear about this. To which Barbara Bush turns to him and says, I know. <laughs> on that note, why don't we turn on the lights and open this up for questions? Yeah. Let's see the where are the mics? Julie, can you maybe help people if yeah, here's a question right here. Great. Could you talk about Nancy Reagan and the Reagan ranch? It seems awfully rustic compared to how Nancy liked to portray herself. Oh, the, the, the Reagan ranch is not, you know, we're not talking about, you know, the big valley out there. It is a, an absolutely tiny, tiny little house. Reagan, Ronald Reagan adored it. She it could have cared less, but she, what she knew was that her husband needed that, that he was, it was, it would restore him. He, he, he loved it out there. So basically what she would do is sit by the pool and talk to her friends on the phone. And I know one of the, the head of his secret service detail told me too, she, she didn't like horseback riding, but she would do it because he loved it. And um, so the head of the detail told me that he would saddle up her horse and at the appointed time that they were supposed to go riding, he would ring a bell and then he'd have to ring it again <laughs> and then he'd have to ring it again. And eventually she would, uh, she would show up. But again, she knew that he needed it. And um, so she was well, he spent hundreds of days out there during his presidency and at the end, you know, as he's going into Alzheimer's, the family is really hoping that the ranch can be kind of where he spends his late days. And it's really, and I think one of the saddest parts of the book is when he be starts to become very in uncomfortable with the Alzheimer's setting in, in the place that he had loved more than any other place in the world. And when the, again, Secret Service agents begin to realize he can't handle his horses, his horse the way he had, and they're gonna have to tell him that he can't ride anymore. And it, you know, again, there had been hope that he could sort of spend some of his final years, a lot of them out at the ranch and it was not to be. Another question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Tonight's been lovely. Um, I just finished uh, Patty Davis's Floating in the Deep End uh, and survived my own Alzheimer's journey with my father. Uh, could you speak to uh, Nancy's endurance during that time? Uh, the way Patty talks about her, she rarely left his side. Uh, and I think maybe at some point during that time, she and Patty came to some kind of understanding. So if you could speak to that. It's, it's true. Um, Nancy Reagan's father, her adopted father, um, ultimately her mother remarries and her adopted father is somebody who was a pioneering neurosurgeon in the 1920s. So she grew up as the daughter of a doctor. She was really very, she used to go watch her father do surgeries. Um, but as a result, she was very interested in medical issues. She was pretty sophisticated about them. But for a while, early on, she thinks they can fight this. You know, this disease is not going to take my husband. But ultimately, she does come to accept the very long, heartbreaking journey, the longest goodbye, as she said it, that they were on. Um, ultimately, it gets to the point where 
he doesn't even recognize her. But it does also, Patty at that point, their daughter is estranged, has been estranged from the family for several years. And it really is the Alzheimer's that kind of brings Patty back. And there is, it, it isn't always smooth between the mother and daughter, but it does sort of bring the family back together. Julie, any questions from the chat room? So we have a question from the virtual audience, Dennis Jennings. Did you find anything in Nancy's life before her marriage to Ron that played a unique role in her success, anything in her college years or her education? Oh, thank you so much for asking. I, um, I, the most fun to me in the entire book was researching the Hollywood years, the, the stage years. Um, and I do think that both of the Reagans, because they did come out of Hollywood, had a very clear sense of the importance of the image of the stagecraft. But um, one of the stories I came across, because Nancy's, Nancy's mother had been an actress, not a very successful one, but she was a networker, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, a trait she passed along to her daughter. And as Nancy was growing up, one of the family's closest friends was the actor Spencer Tracy, who, while he was one of the most beloved figures in Hollywood, had a secret of his own, which is that he was a violent alcoholic. And when he needed to dry out away from the gossip columnists of Hollywood, Nancy's father would arrange for him to have a private floor in, on Passivant Hospital in Chicago. And then he would go and stay with the Davis family and then ultimately be on his way. So Spencer Tracy was not only a close friend, but he, he owed a very deep debt to Nancy Davis and her parents. So when it comes time, she gets a screen test at MGM, biggest Hollywood studio there was. It's Spencer Tracy who engineers this screen test. So she cannot flunk it. Uh, usually for a screen test, they would just grab whatever technicians uh, were available. Tracy makes sure that like her screen test is directed by George Cukor, who's known as the women's director and, you know, directed Catherine Hepburn and, you know. So she, although Cukor thought, deemed her to have no talent, she nonetheless gets this contract with MGM. My favorite little detail of the, my favorite little trivia of the entire book, and it's only half of the sentence, is that because MGM signs Nancy Davis, it, that's one of the reasons they decide to take a pass in 1949 on another actress, which is the reason they don't sign Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> which has got to be one of the worst decisions ever made by any Hollywood studio. Let's see, any other questions? Here. Here. Ah, good. Joya? Uh, <clears throat> do you have any knowledge as to how the choice okay. of the portrait artist came to be? And if so, uh, I know it's the same gentleman who did the iconic photo of the iconic painting of President Kennedy. And if, and if you do know that, my, my follow up question is, do you know how much input Mrs. Reagan had into how she chose to pose? Obviously the pose were, had to be built last, but the pose itself. Um, I don't know, the, the portrait artist in question is, is uh, Aaron Schickler, who, has, who did paint Jackie Kennedy's portrait um, uh, and also was, picked to do Nancy Reagan's. But interestingly enough, she was more obsessed with Ronald Reagan's portrait. And I just didn't make the book, but I'll tell it here anyway. So as Schickler is painting Ronald Reagan's portrait, he keeps getting these phone calls from Nancy saying, Ronnie's not happy with this portrait. Really, the shoulders need to be bigger. The, really, the shoulders need to be bigger. And um, it turns out not to be a very successful portrait, but when they finally unveil it, 
Schickler says to Ronald Reagan, he says, how are your shoulders? And Reagan says, fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. You know, it was, he didn't, it was like Nancy Reagan wanted him to look like a linebacker. What's your next book? Oh, gosh. I, that was the I, next question from Carol oh, Maton. Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead. All right. You know, I thought about this. Um, Simon & Schuster is very, the reviews on this one were really, I, I was so. Uh, they were outstanding. I'll say it for you. <laughs> and I, you know, it, it, you get kind of humbled. I mean, you sort of send it out in the world and you think, what are people going to think of this? Um, I, I don't really know. I, I love doing biography. I would want it to be somebody else who is complex, who may have been not really understood by history. I, I'm not that interested in writing a book about somebody who everybody thinks is a saint. Um, so if you have any ideas, uh, let me know. But biography is just so, it's just so gratifying to be able to kind of step back and in inhabit somebody else. Nothing else? All right. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for being here. And Karen, you were marvelous. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Okay.